you all to be here. Well, in this um, second panel discussion, we're going to talk about the technology, uh, technological uh, challenge in the enterprise agility initiatives. So to introduce this topic, I think that, as David said previously, all the good agilists must do, to talk with some metaphor. <laughs> Mine here is that um, if you like to cook, um, it's important to know the theory after, after each characteristic of each ingredient, how to prepare one, one recipe. So the knowledge are really important, but if you don't have the correct tools, won't be able to, you are not going to be able to prepare even one recipe. So the tools have, they're important, and even more maybe in the enterprise, in the enterprise level. So we have here for, for professionals, all of them with their own tool related to the agility and, and Kanban. So I'm going briefly to introduce all of them and later maybe yourself can explain the main characteristic of your tools or your company or whatever you, you prefer. Um, here at my left, um, Sonia Siderova. She's founder of NAVE, certified in Kanban coach and lane project manager. Um, she has facilitated organizational change, helping to large scale business meet the exit its value focused objectives. Um, he has been more than one decade, de de decade um, um, experience in software development and process optimization and product manager. Thanks to NAVE and and its analytics has helped the companies to optimize and its workflows using that driven approach to be focused on numbers and not on the assumptions or guesswork. And she loves boxing also. And I hope that you, you don't need to use any techniques here. I hope not. <laughs> <laughs> I need to watch out. <laughs> At her left, Mahesh Singh. Um, of Shift Kanban, Shift Kanban, and he has been working working closely with with um, David Anderson, and has led the development of Shift Kanban product to adopt principles of the Kanban methods, and using its adoption by organizations implementation of Kanban. He is accredited Kanban trainer and Kanban coach professional by the Lean Kanban University and he has more than 25 years of experience in product manager, marketing, and consulting. Um, since um, uh, he has involved in Kanban community and lead Digites participation in Legend Kanban conference. At his left, Guillermo Montoya, CEO and co-founder of Dacer. He has almost eight years adopting agile principles um, and company transformation and building Dazer more open and innovative. Um, Dazer has been for more than eight years a Atlassian Platinum Partner Enterprise, and he knows very well the main tools, Jira and Confluence, and has been implemented them in a few companies. He's a passionate about the technology and collaboration between transformation and, and both to transform the so society. He's a compulsive reader, and I like a lot that you are a writer of a book that is only in your head. <laughs> Still. Also, you are a marathonist, no? You, you love to run, and you are a smoker. So maybe at the end you can bring us some, some advice to quit. I don't know. And you don't know? Okay. Wow. <laughs> well. And finally, Dimitar Karaivanov. CEO and co-founder of Kanbanize. He's a lean thinker and Kanban practitioner. Uh, with Kanbanize, he has helped companies to manage big initiatives spread across multiple teams. He's a passionate about uh, achieving ex extreme performance and scale and applying lean and Kanban outside IT areas. He is author of a free book, Lean Software Development with Kanban, and he's an, act an active member of lean and Kanban community. So maybe you can talk just two, three minutes regarding your tools. Why do you think that they are important to help enterprises to, to make adoption of, the, of Kanban or agility? 
maybe Sonia first. Um, our company develops Kanban analytics tools um, that integrates with different types of platforms like Jira, Asana, Trello, GitHub, and there are plenty of others in um, our backlog till the end of this year as well. We think that the most of the benefits that comes out of our product is that many companies are not willing to actually move to a specialized software when, when they actually um, have any agile initiatives in place. They would prefer to stay with the tools they have. And our focus is to help that, to help them actually adopt the Kanban method by providing the additions um, they would benefit with. So I guess we uh, work with the rest of the companies who want to move. <laughs> so, um, um, Digita has been in the business for uh, about 18 years with uh, enterprise agile and application life cycle management tools. And uh, Swift Kanban has been there for the last uh, <clears throat> about eight years, since 2011. And um, I think we see the full spectrum of people who want to work just with physical boards and are happy with that and people who are very uh, focused on the Kanban method as taught by the Lean Kanban University and the community. And uh, there are various reasons why they decide to go for a professional tool. It could be simply the fact that they are large and they have distributed organizations, uh, teams, and they need to have everybody uh, be on the same page as far as the work that they're doing. Uh, or uh, they could be looking at going up the maturity model and uh, uh, measuring themselves better. So therefore, metrics are a strong reason why they might uh, look at a tool like uh, Swift Kanban. Um, but I think the, ultimately the tool vendor's job is to make sure that they're flexible enough that it is able to fit the, uh, the uh, specific culture of the organization that is trying to implement the tool so that you're able to uh, meet the requirements of the organization rather than meet the requirements of the tool. And I think we are good at that. Hello. Uh, I am not sure if I am the proper person to be an advocate of Atlassian, but uh, we are not, uh, because we are not the builders. We are, we are a solution partner. We are a platinum solution partner here in Spain. But uh, from, my, from my point of view, Atlassian tools, I don't know if you remember Larry Bird, the NBA basketball player. He wasn't the best by jumping, he wasn't the best passing, he wasn't the best throwing, but he was always the MVP. Uh, I think that in some cases, in some scenarios, maybe Atlassian tools are just like Larry Bird. Uh, they are not the best, they are not the best tools, but they integrate very well with all the areas around them. So maybe with Jira, with the Confluence, with uh, the apps, sometimes you will be able to have the, the solutions to your problems. But probably in other cases, you would prefer another tools. In some cases, in, in these cases, in these first cases is where Atlassian tools maybe will fit better. And I will try to, to explain some of these scenarios. Thank you. I really like that metaphor about basketball. So I'm, I'm going ahead and I'm going to say that Kanban is the Michael Jordan of the Kanban world. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I'm older. <laughs> uh, uh, um, w what we exist for uh, on this world is to help management scale Kanban across the company. We know um, that a lot of companies start on a team level and that's table stakes. In the, in the Kanban world, team level is table stakes. You, you can start doing it. If you get professional help in a matter of months, you will be doing it well. If you persist for a few years, you'll be very good. But then the real challenge comes in. How do you scale that 
to the middle management and even further to the senior management, that's a very difficult, very challenging topic. And we dedicate our entire time on making it possible to have the tooling to support you to scale Kanban across the organization. Still a long way to go. It's a very difficult task. To make some feature available in Kanbanize, first we test it internally at least for six months because we cannot release something that doesn't work. We test internally. We, we try to scale it with, within our own company. And when it works, we make the features available to the rest of the world. So it's, it's a slow process. It's like discovery, uh, like discovering the next generation tooling to manage um, big companies. But we are very persistent, very stubborn, and um, we'll, we'll succeed in, in the short term. So stick with us and see what happens. Well, thank you. Well, because, uh, before I start with some of the questions we have uh, prepared, if any of you have any question, raise your hand. We are not going to wait until the end of the session because maybe you forget the questions. So maybe wait until they finish their speak, but ask in each moment of the, of the session, please. Um, okay, let's get to start. Um, technological challenge. Maybe the first one, we must talk about the physical boards, no? In Kanban, still a lot of people prefer physical boards, the techni technical uh, boards. So what do you think about the physical boards? Which are the benefits uh, or which are the limitations of them? And especially focused on the enterprise agility. Someone of you want to begin or come Yeah, on. I have very strong feelings for that, so I can start. First, <laughs> I have to say that I love physical boards when I'm a team in a, uh, like in a team of five, uh, a team of seven, all in the same room. I think it's, it's, it's very good to have the physical board in there. But uh, as I talk about scaling Kanban across the company, and this is the, the topic that occupies my mind 24 seven, I think it's theoretically possible to do it with physical boards, but practically impossible to do it. Because the ones who are gonna win long term, big time, are the ones that will be able to build information highways from the very small team somewhere in the organization to the top senior management so that the action on the team level is automatically propagated across the hierarchy and provides a data point for the senior management to actually take decision. So to me, Kanban, uh, is, is, is the infrastructure to make data available to the top management so that we can take the right decisions and ultimately be agile on, on, on the business holistic level. So my point is that if you are serious about scaling Kanban, physical boards will not work. 99.9% .9 probability will not work. Uh, if you just want to try Kanban and see if it works for you, it's a good start. That's my own opinion, of course, so take it with a grain of salt. Come on. Sorry, uh, there, are, there are also another challenges that uh, we have to address with uh, physical boards uh, that's uh, to collect data and to get the data from all the teams all over the, the company in big companies is pretty impossible with uh, physical boards, as you said. And also, now that we are trying to encourage uh, the remote work on companies, in many companies, uh, it's very difficult to manage all with a physical board. So we need to contact people from all over the world to get the team's work properly. So from that point of view, we need to transform the physical information to the digital board, and maybe sometimes we can share both approaches. But uh, in the end, the whole information must be on these tools so that we can get all the uh, data and gather the data and get the, the info out for the management. Mahesh, Sonia? Uh, well, I think uh, to extend uh, Dimitar's uh, discuss, I mean, the point of view further, I think IT and software, and I think maybe software alone possibly, is the only discipline where we even consider doing something with paper and pencil. I think if you look at any other business function, nobody will consider that, okay, let's first implement the process in, with paper and pencil or, or stickies, and it doesn't matter if they fall off the board. 
and then we will move to an electronic system next. I mean, any any organizational activity typically works with a with a proper system. So I think from that point of view, uh, we've been in the business for uh, 15, 16 years. We've seen that, uh, like uh, like Demetar said, if you're serious about doing what you're doing, whether it is application lifecycle management, whether it is project management, whether it is um, Kanban, you got to have a tool that works for you and which helps bring a sort of a decentralized a distributed organization in the same place and gives you the measurement and the visibility across all the levels of the organization. And so therefore I think it's important that very quickly out of uh, maybe maturity level zero, you move to a electronic tool that works for you. If you allow me to add just one more thing. Uh, I, I, by no means am I claiming that Kanbanize or uh, any other tool is perfect, right? We, we do know that we still have some way to go, but we need to work together with uh, the consultants, with the customers, with the vendors to elevate the world of Kanban software to a state where we can all claim that we can scale this whole thing and manage our organizations effectively. So we don't take this as a sales pitch. That's not the goal here. The goal is to invite a dialogue between everybody so that we make it better together. Maybe the next question is also applying a lot for Nave. So this is mainly for you, but also for everybody. Because you have said that one of the most important topics is to, to gather information, not to gather data, to take decisions. So um, regarding the metrics, which are the main metrics that you think that we can use the tools to help the organization to, to, to take decisions? Well, when it comes to lower maturity um, level teams, it's, um, it's important to keep track on the, the metrics on a process level. Um, it's important to think about how fast are you? What are your lead times? How the trends build over time? It's important to, to think about how much work you can actually deliver for a certain period of time. It's important to keep track of how much work in progress you have in your system. It's important to, to make sure that the trends are building incrementally and you actually improve. That's, that's the manner that the Kanban method provides when it comes to tracking continuous improvement. You need to be aware of those basic flow metrics, the throughput, the cycle time, the working progress, to actually uh, maintain the stability of your system and at the same time to measure if you're improving or if you're not improving. Then that data from there on needs to have a purpose you need to make decision based on that data. It's not just for reporting, it's not just to, to put, it, put it on the table for the higher management. That data should have its purpose. You need to make decisions based on it. And furthermore, um, on, the highest on the higher levels of maturity, it's very important to talk about outcomes so far. And I believe that the, the fit for purpose framework is very suitable on that manner. Thank you. Uh, in our case, uh, with, uh, with Atlassian tools, we have uh, an open API that uh, you can get uh, uh, info inside the tools and get it out. So if you have this info in, in the tool, you can get it out with this API. Uh, not only the tool, but also the apps of the marketplace. For instance, you have, uh, in this case, one call is EBI that you can make some graphics. You, you can create the, the, the information at a project level with your portfolio, with a uh, big picture, depending on your radical approach to the scaling agile uh, organization. Uh, so the most important thing is that you have to collect the relevant information to get this information out. In our case, in the case of uh, Atlassian, you have the basic tool, Jira software, and then you have to get this info out of the tool by creating an app or by using one app from the Atlassian marketplace. 
the, it, would, in, it depends on your, uh, the approach that you're applying or you are uh, applying an, a agile approach or a common approach. You have uh, all the instruments inside the tool so that you can get this involved. Uh, so we've tried to provide two types of uh, metrics. One is that helps you um, essentially um, measure how well you're implementing the Kanban method itself. So therefore, uh, there are things such as the cumulative flow diagram or the cycle time analysis or uh, lead time analysis and uh, uh, things like flow efficiency, et cetera, that give you a path to implementing specific uh, uh, processes that the Kanban method talks about. But the other thing that we also try and do is to help you understand how well are you following the process that you think you're following. So Kanban talks about starting from where you are. It is interesting to see how many teams figure out as they, as they start to use a tool like uh, Swift Kanban that the, that the process that they thought they had was really not the process that they were following. And the documentation, the evidence of that comes out of the, uh, some of the metrics that we provide to show you that the, the process that you visualize on your Kanban board is really not being followed. And so we help you track some of the process deviations that you're doing, and in that sense, help you with process, uh, uh, improving a process or changing a process to what you think you should be following that, uh, you should be implementing on the on a Kanban board. So there are two types of metrics that we provide, uh, and as you grow up the sort of uh, um, maturity of the Kanban tool itself, uh, you can start to use those metrics in a phased way. I obviously agree with what my colleague said. I would like to add one thing though. I think there's growing responsibility for the tools on the market to be the leading indicators and not the lagging indicators. What typically happens is we allow things to go bad and then we show you that they, that they went worse. We show you that cycle time is going up. We show you that throughput is going down, but why? Could have we prevented this. And I think tooling, and I know about Kanban as for sure, it's going in that direction. Tooling has to go in this direction to actually give real-time feedback to the people that are about to make a mistake in terms of flow, right? There's no right or wrong, but in terms of flow, we can believe that there's right or wrong. So when I start some task somewhere on my team board in isolation, not knowing it will trigger something to go up three levels in the hierarchy and, and then start a new feature, why don't the tool just say, hey, listen, this is probably not the best thing to do right now. Why don't you take this other task? It's going to be the final one for the feature that has been in progress for two years. <laughs> why don't we just finish this one? So I, th I, th I think tooling has to focus on being proactive, how to improve the metrics that we know of, and, and, uh, and less and less show that things have been um, going down. So I, I think that that's what we all should do. Good. Let's go on. Um, one of the things that we talk about uh, Kanban is the incremental change. Um, this includes incremental change of the, of the board design also. And what challenge have you seen with enabling these in digital boards? Mahesh? Yeah. Uh, sure. Yeah. So yeah, so I think that's one area that I think uh, uh, has a significant uh, impact on people moving from physical boards to, uh, to digital boards. Physical boards have the advantage that you can pretty much do what you like with the board. Whereas uh, with, uh, once you set things in the electronic form, then there are certain things you've got to follow based on the basic architecture of the tool, the philosophy of the tool. And I'm sure each tool has its own sort of approach to how you help them manage the change. So, um, so you've got to be careful in terms of, or rather you've got to be aware of the fact that as you move from a physical board to an electronic board, uh, there will be changes in the way that you can manage that. Uh, in uh, Swift Kanban, I think we have tried to pay attention to that as, as much as we can to firstly allow as much changes as you like. Uh, so it's very configurable from the way that you want to uh, design the initial board to, uh, to uh, evolve it as your process improves or it changes, or you feel the need for uh, improvement. 
One thing that we do try and tell teams to do is to keep it very simple to start with and then evolve as the, uh, as the uh, uh, team requires it. We have seen many times that when people move from the physical board to the electronic board, it is uh, one of the, I think I saw a, um, the point, one of David's uh, presentation, uh, the, one of the uh, slides said that it is an inflection point or something like that where you are realizing the change, need for sort of take, doing a uh, introspection and seeing what changes you want to make. So, it, so when, when teams move from a physical board to, uh, uh, to Swift Kanban, or even from another tool to Swift Kanban, they are at that time also taking stock of how well is Kanban working for them or how well the process is working for them. So they try and model the most, uh, the best process that they think they should have in Swift Kanban. And as a result, they over-configure the Kanban board and then they have to reorganize their thinking based on the way they actually, uh, the process is really working. So. The, tools, the tool definitely provides you the support for um, making your process changes as often as you need. Uh, also, you need to then be able to say that the, the metrics uh, that are deriving from those process are able to support the changes. And we try to take care of that as well as much as possible so that you are able to, uh, you, you are able to keep in sync the process change to the changes in the metric itself. Uh, Brett. <coughs> for Mahesh, uh, Guillermo, and, and Dimitar. So the, the, there's an element that you, that in Kanban we, we want teams to be able to change their processes and we want them to be able to evolve that. At the same time, we recognize when we're talking about managing stuff at the portfolio level and the recognition that some of the blockers that teams face are central blockers rather than distributed blockers. So they should be managed centrally or as opposed to distributed. Now, what... It, what I want to be able to do at some point, because there's a tension now between standardizing the process that we can recognize central blockers and deal with central blockers versus distributing the process and allowing teams to come up with whatever they want. But then at some point, I need to be able to reconcile all those distributed processes so that I can analyze them and understand what are the central blockers. How do you manage that tension between those two things? Right. That's a great, great point. Uh, and we have different tools that handle it differently. So Swift Kanban in particular, uh, we have enabled the architecture in such a way that you can actually uh, define things centrally to begin with and have all of those uh, sort of centralized processes available to all the teams, but that at the team level they can make changes to the process the way they want to, in, uh, uh, you know, based on their specific process that they're following or the customer that they're dealing with, et cetera. So their specific business requirements can be modeled as far as the team is concerned. And what we make, what we make possible is that whatever the team level changes are, they, are avail they become available at the, end, at the central or the enterprise level again. So it is now up to the enterprise level to see whether they want to consolidate the changes that the teams are making or let the teams keep their changes. So therefore there is a uh, sort of federated model between what the central or the core team wants to do versus what the team has done and for them to be able to uh, reconcile every now and then based on what they, what they feel is the right model for them to work as an organization. So there is, there is the freedom for the teams to do what they want to uh, based on a recommendation from the central organization. Oh, in, in, uh, in the case of Atlassian, the solutions are very pretty general. So you have to deal with the, 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 the basic, the foundation that is your software and then to up uh, to an to add an app or adapt the how the 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 the, the, the whole is working, uh, adding your portfolio or another solution depending on what you are looking for. Not always you will be able to get what you are looking for, but uh, you have the very a lot of flexibility to try to get this behavior. Also now try to cover in all the news uh, scenarios. Uh, you you have the option of Jira Align that uh, it's able to manage uh, different portfolios from different point of views. But uh, from this point of view, probably Atlassian solutions are less specific. So you will have to work a bit more in order to get uh, the restrictions uh, as you want by using an app, using Jira software, and then adding some uh, specific software development using the using the API. And if I um, need to be the Michael Jordan again, 
I will say that Kanbanize has two types of boards. One is called the team board and the other one is called the management board. Uh, it's a fairly new concept, uh, but we came up with it, with it specifically for this type of problem. So we want that to have the teams owning their own boards. It, ha it has to do with what they need, what's comfortable for the team, uh, just complete freedom. Of course, we have permissions, so no, uh, some people can edit the board, some others cannot, but it's very flexible on the team level. And then if you are a manager of some sort, you can define your own board however you like it, just for you, and then connect those team boards, your management board, so that work flows from the management board to the team board, and then it feeds feedback towards the, the management board again. So if you have three teams, you can have a single management board connect to three teams. And then if you have a central blocker, you can see it on your management board and decide what to do with it. On the other hand, if the blocker is on the team board, the team is capable to resolve the blocker themselves or escalate it by propagating the blocker to your management board. So we solve this problem with, with the, the concept of team versus management board. Uh, and the management board is typically owned by a single person. That's how we do it. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> okay, let's talk about the dependencies, okay, that are clearly a challenge um, in the enterprise solutions. What capabilities and challenges do you do you see with the dependencies in relation with the, with the tools? Sonia? I will talk <laughs> again. <laughs> And as, uh, as I told you before, we have a foundation uh, that is your software, and in your software there are links uh, between issues. Uh, what we, what uh, the Atlassian marketplace is trying to do, is to apply a type, a kind of semantics to these links by applying certain rules and constraints, try to manage the dependencies between issues. That's the reason uh, to build, uh, for instance, in the case of Jira portfolio, you can manage uh, project portfolios and uh, try to manage the dependencies between them. Also, there, are, there is another app called Structure, uh, when, where you can jump the limitation, the constraint of two levels in Jira, trying to build a virtual organization of five, four levels and try to describe dependency between them. So uh, again, the, the solution, uh, there are another solutions here. You, we, can, we can talk about them uh, uh, after, after, the, after, uh, after the talk. Uh, this, the, the, the option is to have a base, uh, in this case a Jira software, and try to build uh, with an app the solution to your problem. In this case, we have Jira portfolio uh, and uh, structure to solve this problem. Also, you have a big picture as three of the possible scenarios to manage the dependencies between the tasks or between the different uh, issues, in, in this case, in Jira. First of all, it's a very tough topic, really. It's a very tough topic, and I don't think any tool vendor should claim that uh, they are doing a good job at it. Um, I can tell you what we are doing. It, it's far from perfect, but I think it's 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 the right direction. We support two two ways of, uh, of dependencies. One one type is hierarchical, meaning breaking down work vertically from a big initiative to the the task level, and then horizontally. Sorry, uh, then horizontally from team to team. So we have a concept called related boards. You can relate the boards of teams together, so that they can throw work or request work from other teams while still seeing the progress of this work. Uh, because very often you need something done by this guy or this guy from the other team and you request it over email or on, on the water cooler chat and then it doesn't happen for ages. So we try to provide the gateways to other teams so that we can request work predictably, responsibly, accountably. But I have to admit it's a very tough topic. So um, I'm not yet perfectly satisfied with how we do it in Kanbanize, but we are going to, con to keep digging in that direction until we make it 
so easy for people to request work and receive the, the response of this work that it's basically a no-brainer for everybody. I, I, I think we still have some work to do in this area. So, um, firstly, I agree with you that it's a, it's a tough challenge. Um, so the way that we support it is in multiple ways. So firstly, I think we provide uh, for dependencies of different types. So parent-child hierarchy, uh, start and stop, you know, finish and start type of dependencies uh, where something has to finish before something else can start, uh, and traceability-related dependencies. Uh, these are the three different ways that uh, dependencies can be depicted, and then they're visualized on a dependency board so that you can see what the dependencies are. Um, in addition, what we have got is a couple of other things that I think help in managing your uh, managing the workload of dependent or the shared resources that you have. Typically, people like the UI UX people or the documentation teams or architects and so forth. Uh, so we have the concept of shared resources. So you can de you can de you can designate teams of people as as shared resources, so people know that these are uh, these are people available to be used in in different Kanban boards, even though they're not actually team members of that Kanban board. So it just makes it easier to uh, use those shared resources. Uh, and then finally, we have a WIP, uh, while you have the column and the lane level WIP limits that are common to uh, most tools, we have something called a resource level WIP limit that you can, that you can have that are defined for critical resources in your organization so that you know how, how, uh, how loaded they are at any point in time, and therefore you can help reducing their overburdening. Uh, and finally, of course, the fact is that we encourage our customers to design boards so that the shared teams or the shared resources have their own boards or their own swim lanes within a shared board so that it becomes easier again for people to understand what the shared resources use, utilization is and then they can be utilized more effectively. And in terms of data, when it comes to dependencies, um, it becomes immediately visible when the, the work gets blocked. So it's very important that any tool has the means to actually specify blocked work. Um, by specifying blocked work, we are actually are able to measure the efficiency of the workflow. It's, um, there are quite a lot of approaches of improving workflow efficiency. You can work on optimizing your process or you can work in the collaboration or in, within the team. But what actually makes the most of the delays uh, is the time that your work is staying blocked. So it is very important to have the, the approach to track that time, the block time, how much time a certain task has stayed in process there is very important to make the comparison between how how that time is actually uh, associated with the rest of the work that we've already finished. So if you know that a certain task actually goes above 50% of the tasks that you've already done, then you obviously have a problem. And it is very important to visualize that problem and to work upon it, because this is where the most of the delays are actually coming from. Well, and we have been speaking about the dependencies between teams or between issues, etc. But also exist dependencies between tools, no? And all the companies have different tools. It's really difficult to find some company with just one toolkit or one suite that solve all the problems. So, regarding integration between tools, which are the challenges that you have found? Um, how you solve it? Just a warranty when really integration between all the tools. Instead. I can take this. Uh, we are dealing with this problem pretty much whole, the whole time. Um, the main challenge, challenge comes from the fact that the different tools that we integrate with have their own API specifications. The goal behind the integration is always the same. We want to collect the data, we want to shape the data into a, a, a nice graphs that actually provide information. But in order to collect that data, we need to actually fight with a lot of legacy software out there. Mm. Um, there are tools that have been started in a certain manner, then they have been changed, and it is really a challenge to actually integrate them. Most of the things, they are not intuitive, they don't make sense. There are tools that actually 
we were forced to build upon their API in order to fetch the data that we need in order to build our graphs. So it's all mainly the challenge comes from the fact that the tools that we integrate with, they're not able to provide the data in a consistent manner. Very often, even, even the way they provide it is pretty unstable. Uh, a good example could be that once, uh, once we integrate with a certain tool and we fetch the data, it is really important for us to have a real-time communication with that product. It is really important to have the updates right away at the moment that they occur. In order to achieve that, we need to have the means from that tool to actually send the data to us. And it's just technically impossible in some of the cases. We need to look for alternatives like instead of having webhooks for the technical audience here, we need to actually pull the data, which is really expensive, and there are quite a lot of limits that we need to take into consideration. So it's more about the tools that are providing the options to integrate with where the most of the challenges lay. Uh, in uh, in our case, uh, this is a similar situation about the APIs. Uh, one of the essence of Atlassian is to create a an, an, uh, marketplace with the apps so that the apps can add uh, functionality to the core base of Jira software or Jira core or Confluence. In this case, we have uh, around 4,000 apps, but the problems are still the same that you mentioned. It's sometimes difficult to connect the tools and even more, it depends also on the deployment method. In the case of Atlassian tools, for instance, we have the server on-premise uh, uh, licensing and cloud licensing, Atlassian cloud. Uh, both are different, and there are even implications regarding GDPR. Uh, so it depends where you have the data. Uh, you will be able to connect or not, depending on the rules or the constraints you have on the information you can pass through or not, depending on the limitations. For instance, in the United States and in Europe, there are kind of different rules. So it's not only a technical issue, but also a legal issue, so that you can get info from and to uh, the tools outside or inside your own ecosystem. In our case, uh, even the, the Angira is now, is now a kind of legacy software because it's been 17 years since Jira was built, for instance. So in this case, uh, Atlassian is rebuilding the tool, trying to, to create a, a better tool so that uh, they can connect easily, easier with, uh, with other, other, other marketplaces and other ecosystems and other tools. So uh, the, the, the integration needs a good uh, API definition a good uh, documentation of the, the tools and a good uh, uh, relationship between the 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 the, the, pass, the, the information that that had to be passed from one tool to another i'd like to add just a few more words and uh, it's towards making the differentiation between integration and replication in, in cameras we suffer a lot from customer requests about replication that come in as integration. What I mean, um, sometimes people will have their own tool that has been there for ages and there's a lot of data into it. Um, and they don't like it for some reason and they, don't, they, they wanna use Kanbanize because for whatever reasons. But what they actually want is to use Kanbanize and then Kanbanize to feed all the data into this proprietary tool. But this is replication. And this scenario is almost always doomed to fail because you cannot integrate two tools in a way that they are the same, right? They, they are different tools. So they have their own benefits, their own, own weaknesses. So I would, I would just, uh, just like to point out that we should talk about integrations and not replications because replication is a, a doomed path for almost anybody. So I'll just add one more aspect to it, which is that, uh, uh, so firstly in Swift Kanban, we've solved the problem through two ways. One is that we have an integration tool called Swift Sync and that, uh, that integrates with about 50 plus tools and it does a bi-directional synchronization of data. So it's very easy to sort of put the integration in place. 
and have it working. We also have a pretty solid uh, web services layer that, uh, again, uh, allows customers to build integrations with uh, in-house tools or other tools that we don't support with SwiftSync. Uh, so I think the, the additional aspect that I just wanted to mention is that I think maybe, uh, and Guillermo, you mentioned that to some extent, is that the technical integration is the easy part. I think the challenge comes from the business layer integration. Uh, you may have implemented workflows in a certain way in uh, you know, the other tool that, you know, that is already there, but when you want to put it on a Kanban board, you want to do it slightly differently. You want to have a slightly different workflow or a visualization. So the business uh, translation uh, is where the discussion comes when we, when we are integrating our, our Swift Kanban tool with uh, whatever be the in-house tool. Um, and it's always interesting to, it's for us very interesting to learn the business uh, about uh, you know, what the customers are trying to do uh, with their internal tool as well as with Swift Kanban. Uh, the good thing is that we are able to manage with the kind of abstraction that you can get both ways. Uh, so it's always possible to do the mapping, but understanding the business uh, drivers for the other tool versus the business drivers for the Kanban tool, uh, how do you get them to map to each other? That's where the challenge really lies. Well, and always using a tool that is a user, no? And Surely with 20% of the features of the characteristics, we are doing 80% of our job. So how you, how you help the people to know which are the main characteristics, the main features of your tool, just to make quite well, efficiency, efficiently their job? How do you help them with training, with hel helpful tools inside the, inside the tools? How do you help them? Um, I'd like to start with this because it's a huge topic. Uh, it's the UX topic, right? How do you make the users happy and, and the user experience good enough? Our take is that we should hide the complexity from the user. Still some way to go, right? There's always somewhere to go. I have customers in the room. I have to be careful what I say. <laughs> so, um, But we spend hundreds of hours thinking how to hide the complexity of the tool so that people wouldn't even think about these things. But when they need it, in the context they need it, then the, the feature magically shows up where exactly you expect the feature to be. It's a very, very challenging task. Of course, we're not perfect. But I think that the only way to successfully do this is through this type of thinking. Of course, we have training. Of course, we have customer success. Um, I, I believe we have one of the best support in the world. I hope the customers will confirm that later on. But nothing replaces the good usability of the software. So I think we shouldn't be hang, uh, hang up on, on training and consulting uh, in terms of the, the, the software vendors. We should just do our homework and come up with the best UX we can. And this is continuous effort, and uh, we, we invest heavily into that year after year. In this, in this case, I will try to talk from a different point of view. I will talk as a, a consultant company. Uh, we are not the Atlassian builders. We are imp implementers of the, of the tools, and we try to deliver the, the tools on different companies. And uh, sometimes, probably, Jira is not the best uh, UX tool. Um, it's a question of uh, some of some companies like Dacer try to convince companies to use this kind of tools and try to know as best as possible to guide the companies on which features should they use. Uh, mainly in a situation, in a scenario like ours, where we have a lot of features, it's a very huge tool. So you have to guide, you have to train, and you have to take in mind that finally, uh, it's not a question of tools, it's a question of tools, people, and practices. So you need a good tool, but you need to train people, and you need to build the best, the best practices. And this is what it comes. Uh, companies like Dacer, like uh, any other company that is able, to implement these tools. Uh, there, are, there is a, a tool 
uh, a fool with a tool is just a fool. Uh, this is uh, a question of uh, these companies trying to get the most of the tools and try to help companies to get the most of these features. So it's important to guide and try to select which features does the company need so that they can get the most of out of them. Okay, so it's a question of how do we select the right work, right? Um, I believe that at least we are in our company, we have defined a classification system based on which we decide what will be the work that we're going to work on next. And this classification system is changing a lot. It is really context specific. For us at this moment, this is um, the most important part of this classification system is to define market opportunities. So what we do, the first thing that we always do is to keep a very close relationships with our clients. We talk a lot to them, we communicate a lot, we try to understand what they, they need, what, the problems, uh, what, what are the problems that they're trying to solve to solve where is the pain for them. Then we identify the solution, the technical solution, um, based on that. And our classification system is actually what tells us this is a great opportunity that we have right now, at this moment. And by keeping um, an efficient Kanban system within the company, basically we have the flexibility to prioritize work until the moment it has been started. So our, our system helps us to define what brings the most value for us now at this moment. And I have to say that we managed to actually realize about 90% of the opportunities that we have by using this approach. So we work with a lot of different uh, sizes of companies. I think the smaller companies, uh, smaller teams that are uh, that are making team level decisions, uh, they are able to use the capabilities of the tool and the some of the things that we provided in the help of our uh, application. We have self guided tours and what we call challenges uh, that that individuals uh, can take up and learn about the tool. Uh, but I think most of the time when we are working with medium and large enterprises. It is a combination of not just the tool features, but the solution that they're configuring on the tool. So it is not just uh, an individual board's features of Swift Kanban. It is really the hierarchy of boards that they have defined, the portfolio program, and the team level boards that they have set up, and the business objects that they are managing on the board. It is really a combination of that that is the focus of the training of these companies when they start to train their teams. So what we really do is to uh, also do a train the trainer approach where we work with the core team and we uh, help them configure this, configure the software for the way they want to use it. And then based on that, we provide the training for the solution that they're going to implement. And uh, we train the core team and then they go ahead and train the rest of the organization. And I think that's been the most effective way that we've seen um, not just Swift Kanban's implementation, but just the success of Kanban in the organization. Okay, and the last question by my side, because just five minutes uh, to complete the time box. But maybe one of the most important, because we're going to talk about the Kanban maturity model. So maybe here is born some partnership with David and <laughs> his school. How can your tool help to improve the company's enterprise challenge, thanks to or jointly with, with the Kanban maturity model? What do you think about? Well, when it comes to data, um, the thing that would make, would make more sense is to actually shape the different types of analytics based on the different maturity models. So I believe that what would really help teams would be to give them, to provide them the exact set of data and analytics that they can actually handle and work upon when it comes to um, their maturity model. Uh, their, their level of maturity model so they don't feel overwhelmed and they actually work the exact set of analytics they need to help them move to the next level. 
Uh, I think that in this context, maybe all of these tools are useful for the maturity model in any way. Uh, they are a source of information, so the, the best ways use any of them. In, in my case, for instance, I'm thinking about an app that can uh, get some of the main uh, concepts of the KMM, for instance, and try to offer the companies uh, and, and specific information about the different levels, for instance. But they think that the most important is to have a, to have a tool supporting the process that you have and the people that is executing the processes. And uh, from our point of view, of course, we, we don't have a specific Kanban tool. We have to adapt. We have to build upon uh, a foundation. So the idea could be to create an app trying to approach to the most important concepts. But I think that all of all, all these tools, of the tools that are today here, can can be useful for for the process. So one thing that we have seen very interesting is that, um, especially when you are looking at a, a sort of a B two B situation where the company is buying the tool, the, the the team that is responsible for selecting the tool, they are trying to buy for the highest level maturity that they think they will get to. So they're looking for the complete feature set. They're looking for all the sophistication of the tool. Um, and therefore, they like to see the full sort of horsepower of the tool. But when it comes to the actual teams using it, we, 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 see, we, we do a lot of instrumentation of the tool to see what is being used, what is not. That the teams are still at the level one or level zero uh, in terms of the usage of uh, the different aspects of the Kanban method. So all of the capabilities that the core team evaluated us for don't really get used. So we are trying to see what best, what is the best way to sort of uh, educate them about the need for that horsepower and really buy, help them buy what they really need to. But irrespective, from a tool capability perspective, we have enough configuration that's available, configuration capability that you can turn off things, turn off the metrics that you're not going to use, and turn them on as, they, as the organization feels the need for those uh, features. Um, in general, though, we provide a sort of set of features which span probably up to level four. Uh, we have actually a paper that is there on our website of how Swift Kanban supports the Kanban maturity model. And uh, uh, you know, you can, you're welcome to take a look at that and see how it, uh, how it maps to your expectations. Uh, but I think we have full coverage of the Kanban maturity model as, as much as needed by most organizations that are implementing Kanban. And then individual teams are free to sort of use the tool as they need to, based on where they are. I can add to what Mahesh said. Uh, I know for sure that 70% of the people that come to trial Kanbanize rate themselves as beginners. So these are people that probably haven't heard about maturity levels, and all they need is visualization of the work and some basic workflow what for example what trello can perfectly well provide for them uh, so i i completely agree with my hash um, we should be able to get to levels three four five maybe in terms of uh, tool capability but m we should take more effort to educate people that these things even exist and provide guidance how to get there something which this conference is starting to do, and I'm optimistic that the message will be more and more heard in the future. Well, um, we must finish, so thank you all for your comments, and we hope that it has been useful for all of you, and thank you for your respect uh, listening to the, to the talks. Thank you. I think that we don't have time for, for questions, so maybe later. Thank you.